Today we're going to talk about an introduction to periquestrian dressage for coaches and athletes. This is material that's been created for the USEF, USPEA, International Periquestrian Dressage Centers of Excellence. Support for this course is made possible by the Department of Veterans Affairs through an adaptive sport grant that was awarded to Carlisle Academy Integrative Equine Therapy and Sports and is done in partnership with the United States Equestrian Federation and the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship International. The information in this presentation may not perfectly reflect the most updated USEF, USDF, and FEI paraquestrian dressage information and standards, and it is the responsibility of every athlete and coach to check the USEF, USDF, FEI uh, paraquestrian dressage rules that are updated annually. The overall course objectives for all of these presentations include developing a foundational understanding of national and international competition in both paraquestrian dressage and paraquestrian driving, to raise awareness among riding schools, therapeutic riding centers, veteran service organizations, and adaptive sport clubs about these exciting Paralympic and international sports as a competitive pursuit beyond equine-assisted therapy or recreation. We have a goal also to connect emerging coaches and athletes to the USEF, USPEA, International Paraquestrian Dressage Centers of Excellence, which provide training clinics, educational symposia, and access to international paradressage coaching experts. And we want to encourage para-eligible veterans to participate in the Department of Veterans Affairs Veterans Assistance Program with trained, knowledgeable coaching support. So today, I'm happy to uh, introduce Michelle Asseline, who's with us today to talk about paraquestrian dressage. Michelle is the head of paraquestrian coach development and high performance consultant for the United States Equestrian Federation. He is a graduate of the French National Equestrian School, home of the Cadre Noir in Somar, and gained a vast international experience in the USA, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom as an international dressage rider and trainer. In 2005, Michelle became the British paraquestrian dressage team coach and led this undefeated team for 12 years. You know, when I came into the sport as a national coach in, in Great Britain in, in 2005, I came from international Grand Prix dressage, so was my wife and still is the same. I didn't have any experience at all. It was really a big jump for me. Uh, but you know, I still think that part dressage and dressage is the same. It's just knowing about horses, athletes, and, and doing it to the best possible ability of, of utmost harmony. It's got to look easy, it's got to look pleasant, not labored, and whether it's dressage or part dressage is the same. Uh, but I think what I've learned from it is that a lot of the athletes, um, you know, if they didn't have the sport, they just feel that they wouldn't have much to live for, especially not so much when athletes are born with that disability, but when you have an athlete that's had a nasty accident, whether it's a car accident or like Gigi McIntosh, a good example, she had a nasty venting accident. When you speak to them in private and in confidence, I mean, they really tell you that is what keeps them going. So there's a sport, there's a competitiveness, which is still in them, but it is also almost like fun for them and it's a reason to live and it's how to fight for life really. So it's, you always think it's not just the competition aspect, it's also a, a way of life, isn't it? And it's another phase in their life. So I think it's, it's quite, um, uh, what's the word in English? You know, it's just remarkable really what human nature can do. It's like having two lives, isn't it? So that's what I wanted to say. There's a lot we, we could talk about, but the, the main thing really in, in, terf, in terms of the equestrian dressage history is that in uh, 2006 is when the FEI took over from the International Paralympic mm -hmm. Association. And that's the official change. Uh, and, and the reason I'm talking about this change is that it's when the culture and the attitudes change suddenly the Paraquestrian community felt, oh gosh, we are endorsed by the FEI. Now it all became very serious. People were not borrowing horses anymore at shows. They were starting to invest into their own horses or find sponsors. And it's really what changed it all. It just went from borrowing horses, 
to the real serious sport of what it is now. That's the big transition, so it's 2006. Uh, yes, the rest yeah. is, is, is fine. You guys obviously know, but a lot of people don't know, they mix. People that don't know about the sport, they often mix the two. It's, it's fine, it, it happens all the time. I don't think it's something to get too excited about, but it is totally different, different organization, uh, and yeah, there it and is. The, the primary um, issue is that Special Olympics does focus on intellectual impairment, where uh, yeah. Paralympics <laughs> focuses on physical impairment. This is really, when you read this, this is why GB has been such at the forefront of the sport. People think, what is it in GB? I mean, yes, there's a good, good structure and so on, but there's a great depth, there's a lot of athletes. Um, big difference that the RDA Center, which is part here, is also interested in competitions so of the sport, where PATH is not really by essence. Uh, they have their own championship. You know, RDA has got their own championship. So that's what motivates more and more the kids when they start, from that point of view. Uh, and John Quill, equally with another lady who passed away, um, Jane Goldsmith. Because we see John Quill there, but Jane Goldsmith, Goldsmith was actually as important, if not more important, because Jane, um, she actually is the one that got me that job with the, with the team originally. Uh, she's the one that used to scout all the RDA centers and go and find people. Or she used to scout normal dressage competitions like here at USDF. And because in, in England, I'm not sure if people do that here, you would have the odd uh, power rider that competes in dressage as well with a special card with their mm -hmm. compensating. You must yep. have that yep. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So she used to find those people and then bring them into the sport. And she did a lot of footwork. She was on the road all the time, I have to say. So it's John so Quill and Jane Goldsmith. And this is the basic history running That's through right. the years. And, and, and you see what I mean? 2006, more or less, when things change with the board horses too. Mm -hmm. And that was a game changer in and of itself. Well, it yeah. just brought everything up. Yeah. It became more serious, more competitive. What it did is that suddenly people had better horses because on a board horse, it is what you get. People are nice enough to give you a horse, so you just do that. But suddenly when you had to look for a horse, well, you just didn't get just anything. You became like you would for any horse. You just became more difficult. I want to get the best I can find. So that suddenly brought things up, and that's really what it is. When the having your own horse came in the equation, it just raised the profile immensely. What's happening today? I mean, obviously, before I came in the picture, you guys were, uh, you know, with, with Lauren Johnson, who was the, uh, is, sorry, the, the Pi Question director, together with Kai Hunt uh, from Texas as the chef de keep. Um, I think it was felt by Will Connell, who is the uh, sport director at USCF, that they wanted to raise the ball even higher. Uh, and basically, Will Connell got in touch with me back in the UK this winter and said, you know, you've been in the, the team coach for GB for 12 years, would you be interested? And actually, I said, I think about it. And a month later, I rang back and said, yes, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for a new challenge. Um, and the reason being is that I've done it for, for GB for 12 years. We've had team medal for those 12 years all the time. Uh, I just, you know, it's like in any business. It's not good to stay in the same business too long. You need to move on. Even if you're successful, you have to move on. And that's what I want to do. We have new challenges. And I love the US. Some of you guys don't know, but I've, I've always been a dual citizen. I've got a French passport, but also an American passport. I've lived in the US in the late 70s, early 80s. So it was for me like coming back home and wanting to help. So there we are. So you all know United States Paraquestrian Association, these things, again, they're for your benefit, but think also they're for the benefit of all the people receiving this information eventually. And Hope Han is the president of uh, USPEA, and they uh, are really there to assist riders. Uh, they are the recognized international affiliate um, in uh, paraquestrian under United States Equestrian Federation, which is our national governing body. And so each discipline has their own affiliate. So just like the Hunter Jumper Association or the USDF Dressage Association, 
um, or federation. So USPA is representing all paraquestrian sport under the, um, you know, the umbrella of USCF, and then above USCF is FEI. Um, so USDF is our recognized uh, dressage federation. USDF does hold the rules for national recognized competition. So you do have to check USDF rules that um, house para rules. Does that make sense? So even though they're, they're basically taking from FEI rules, there may be a modification, mm -hmm. but for the most part, they're taking the FEI rules and embedding it in the para dressage section of USDF rules. So it's critical to look, to look there too. Um, if you're riding FEI, obviously you're following FEI rules. If you're riding um, USDF recognized shows, you're following those rules. Um, we'll get into more of that later. All of these red um, things are hyperlinks to websites. So as people get this electronically, they can click through. As you know, it's, it's your governing body, basically. It's the governing body of all equestrian sport. Uh, but Competitive, internationally. Yeah, yeah, internationally, of course, and, and competitive sport. It's really, people have to remember, it's strictly related to competition. Yeah. The FEI is for competition. Uh, they're there to take royalties. You know, they survive because the, the organizers of the shows will give them some of their proceeds, and that's how they are, who they are. But also, they are ruling the sport as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's that exchange of funding and so on, but they're ruling the sport. Uh, it's not an easy task for them because they get sued. There's a lot of welfare issues. It's, it's a constant uphill battle. Uh, people think it's actually straightforward, but it's not. It's, it's not that easy. It's a really, really big, big job for them because they have so many sports as well. Mm. And I think in the case of Para, really all of the rulings and officials and stewarding and all that really has trickled down from the top and has then um, started to fill in the grassroots layer here in the U.S., but it really has all yeah. started with the FBI template. Yeah. The Paradressage Center of Excellence, really, um, Carlisle is one of the founding members of, we were originally three to start, um, and now we're up to six, and we have a list of those. We are tasked with um, doing this sort of thing, clinics, education, symposia, bringing um, coaching experts, and also eventually um, something that Michelle is going to be developing further is this leveling coaching program, and so we'll be helping to disseminate that once that's all um, <coughs> up and running. But it's really to um, spread the word, do education, um, host clinics, field horses if we can, and uh, so those centers of excellence have all been chosen because of various criteria that, uh, that we met. Good. So, and the list is here. Mm -hmm. This is as of October, um, and you can see all the, all the contacts there. This was actually Will Connell's baby, and he said, you know, it's such a big country. Um, I'm coming from the UK, which is a much smaller country. How are we going to regionalize this and really tackle <coughs> the issue of education um, throughout this big country? And so this is his real, really mm -hmm. his concept. And again, there's um, there on the previous slide, all of those hyperlinks bring you right to <laughs> the place where all you can find the information. The really, the essence of the center of excellence is really to link the uh, therapeutic side of things to the competitive side of thing. That's the real thing, is to bring, bring it in. I think because of Will's influence, he, he, he felt that you know, in Europe, the RDA centers, they are already competition linked. They have their mm. own competitions and so on. So here, it wasn't the case. So by doing something like that, it was just a matter of bridging the pure therapeutic centers, the path centers, into the competition world. Brings sponsors in, more interest, it snowballs, and it just grows. So very important, really. It just makes me think of two young riders, very young, eight and five, who have watched us do these um, clinics and have we've we put it on Facebook and the parents know and they're all kind of watching like, wow, this is this is this could be my kid one day. And they are para eligible children. And so they're coming up in that environment where they see the possibilities or they are witnessing Pony Club taking place in another arena, jumping and uh, venting and all of these other things, or they're going off on the traveling show. And so they're watching that, and the parents are watching and thinking, I can get involved with that. It might be through para, but that's a possibility for me. So that's that wedding of therapy and sport um, that really I think the COEs mm -hmm. are very adept at. And, and can, we can always evolve, and we can always improve and, and find ways to do it better. There's a story in England, too, how it can work, you know, when you speak to them, you just, 
Best is to give them the examples of how it, it's, it's worked in, in, in Great Britain with somebody like Lee Person, for instance, who was and still <laughs> is a role model in, in Pi Question Research, where he came from an RDA center, directions place called South Box RDA. And he was a role model, and we're talking back 10, 15 years ago already, well, 15 years. And it inspired, it inspired other kids by mm -hmm. big numbers. And then that center became so busy because he was a role model. Like in dressage, young girls would be with Charlotte Dujardin. Mm -hmm. Well, he was the one. And they, oh, I mean, she told me, die. you know, when he had the success in the beginning, I mean, she had tenfold more kids wanting to ride, bar kids, because of that. So I think it's something to explain. You know, once, if they have a little bit of success, all it takes is one rider. It does take a lot. And, you know, it's not that they would get more business. Of course, it's good for them, but also it's good for the community because the ones that just are in the shadow, they see something like that and then they come out yeah, and they want to do it. So it's very, very important. And it's people like you guys that have to actually change that culture, make them realize that it's good for everybody. It's good for them, it's good for the community. Hmm. It works. Yeah. Uh, so again, within the within the sport pathway, uh, it's just helpful um, that, and uh, and all of this defining, just as we're trying to define it in path and and um, you know therapy and sport, it's happening uh, within para two. So USEF is really taking. Um, a hold of this, there's a pathway um, in your binder there, it's called the USCF Structure and Pathway. And USCF is really managing the elite and de developing athletes and there's definitions for that, there's an application for that, you know, how do I get on that, um, that list? And then USPA EA is down with the emerging athletes and grassroots education. So that's really um, the structure of things going forward um, in this country, so the competition pathway. And there's a very well-defined uh, this piece here that's in your book, um, the program structure and pathway that I know Will Connell had a big, a big part in playing as well. Um, so again, pipeline development, all have distinct stages of development, definition, support structure, and competition criteria, and that is in your, in your manual. And that's a very good document to, to keep track of, and I, I imagine it will continue to evolve too, and it does sit on the USCF web website. This just relates to the talent identification we talked about, that there is talent out there at PATH centers, at Centers of Excellence, Paralympic Sport Club, uh, Carlisle's a Paralympic Sport Club. That's a whole nother um, area that's really quite interesting. Pony Club we talked about and the better, Veteran Service Organizations. Between Veteran Service Organizations and Paralympic Sport <coughs> Clubs, there are tons of adaptive sport athletes that have no idea if paraquestrian exists. Okay. It's really an untapped resource. I want to just talk a little bit about the Paraquestrian Sport Initiative for Veterans and one of the reasons we were tasked with this project of, of educating both athletes and coaches to make people aware um, that these are sports out there for para-eligible veterans, men and women, who may have a service-connected or non-service-connected injury, but para-eligibility really uh, does require someone to be uh, have a permanent measurable physical disability. So in this case, that might be uh, veterans who have amputations, perhaps a spinal cord injury, a traumatic brain injury. So there's different criteria and requirement for classification, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but basically, the, to, to we, the whole point of this project is to open up these sports of both para-driving and para-dressage to veterans um, as both a challenging equestrian sport beyond equine-assisted therapies and activities. There's a, a great deal uh, that's out there throughout this country among many PATH centers, accredited centers that have veterans at their centers. Uh, perhaps they're doing ground-based work, uh, maybe they're doing um, some Western riding or English riding um, or even equine facilitated mental health work. Um, and so this is really the sport side that's allowing veterans to um, engage in these two very exciting adaptive sports and to show them that there's a competitive pathway that you can be at the grassroots level and in some cases go all the way to the elite level of Paralympics um, if it's paradressage and international FEI um, competition if we're talking about paradriving. So again, it's, it's offering skill progression and meaningful participation in these sports. There's uh, very obvious health and wellness um, outcomes that come 
through participating in adaptive sports, and it's also an opportunity to represent our country. The goals of the Veterans Initiative, again, this is done in partnership with the United States Equestrian Federation, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and PATH International, and the goals are to increase para-eligible veteran participation in Paralympic equestrian sports, specifically para-dressage and para-driving. Um, clinics, outreach, and ongoing education creates access to international gold medal coaching experts and sport-specific classification. Para-eligible veterans are encouraged to participate with the VA's Veteran Monthly Assistance Program. Really what that is is the um, Department of Veterans Affairs has a fund for many, many uh, adaptive sports um, that are part of the Paralympic family or internationally recognized sports. Um, and if somebody meets the criteria, which is listed uh, on, the, on the website, um, if they meet, meet the criteria to be part of a national team, they are awarded a monthly training allowance that covers um, their coaching fees. Um, I mean, there's a, there are caps and, and criteria associated to each level of, of allowance. Uh, but it does cover things like training um, and clinics and uh, show fees, and it just gives them uh, a level of financial support that allows them to pursue the sport. Um, the National Paraquestrian Coach Development Program is designed to create exponential impact on coaching support to para-eligible veterans. So that's part of what we're doing is training um, PATH coaches, able-bodied coaches um, that, that would like to help veterans get involved in these sports. And lastly, we have a goal to coordinate with veterans-oriented games, uh, for instance, the Valor Games or Warrior Games, to bring the two sports of para-driving and para-dressage into those games or a modification of, of those sports to start creating um, a grassroots um, connection to these sports. And again, the, uh, the Veterans Assistance Program, uh, there's a link to uh, what that monthly allowance looks like and the criteria involved and the various levels of financial support. And for any more information, um, I am available to be um, contacted and uh, my information is included and I'm acting as the coordinator of the Veterans Paralympic Equestrian Sport Initiative. So now we're into competition readiness, stages of development, um, types of paradressage competition. As you all know, there's on-site, center-based schooling shows. We do this all the time at Carlisle. We offer para tests of choice. We have a schooling show judge. It's really um, quite basic. You ask the organizers if they'd add a para test of choice. They're not going to have a whole show list of all of the, the grades represented, but you can ask them, um, may I come in and, and ride a para test of choice? Um, again, you might have a borrowed horse. At national competitions, also in England, if it's a smaller group, then of course you could have the winner of the day combining all the grades. But FEI competitions, you, you know, you win your grade and this yeah. is it. So if you compete in grade one, there's two riders in grade one, while well, you're first and second, whoever yeah. it is, in grade one, and that's it. But national is different. Each country's got different rules. Yeah. So I think here you have that where you it's could, a little com combined, it yeah, depends you could, on the you show. You could win a, a combined group sort of thing yeah. with different grades in it. When I first came here, I thought, I mean, the biggest challenge in this country is definitely logistics, the, the vastness of the country. It's less athlete and then the country is even bigger, so it's just, you know, difficult from the word go. Um, and then I sort of studied the scores, I just worked a little bit with Hope and, and the selectors and looked at the scores historically in the last couple of years and I thought, some of these riders are just getting too high scores and they're going to go abroad and they're going to get really, really shocked that actually what they've been used to is not the reality. And, and I'm not going to drop names, but I remember even in Rio last summer, some of the US riders were actually struggling with the scores and some of them were actually looking very nervous. And I thought that's because they've not been exposed enough to those big shows and they've not had the, the marks they should really have lost. So suddenly, they don't do well on the first day in a team test, they're in a big atmosphere and, and, and the nerves are showing and they're not, not doing well at all. And the problem is, of course, when you have an international competition in this country, who, who is going to come? Well, the Canadians is, is about it, isn't it? You might have the odd rider from Guatemala or God knows where, but it's really going to be the Canadians, it's really just you guys and that's what's so hard. Where in Europe, if you're a French rider, you go to Belgium when you've got the Brits, you've got the Dutch, you've got the Danes, the Swedes, 
because it's so much smaller. You know, I can, from my house in England, I can take the Eurostar, the speed train, and I'm in Paris in two hours. You know, a train in two hours. Uh, we have the ferry about half an hour down the road from us. I can take the ferry to Holland, take the overnight ferry, and the following morning I'm in Amsterdam. You know, that's that mm -hmm. easy. So competing is easy. You just, you just always, it's almost like you are within a region of, of all the riders, so you don't think about it anymore. Mm. So the riders I've known here that are suddenly exposed to the continental European riders, then they get really, really nervous because they've not seen them before, and it's actually counterproductive. So I thought, well, let's just use the internet. Let's just do this online competition. So I developed that system with, with Lorraine, contacted judges I know abroad, uh, and I picked two really tough ones, Marco Orsini and Sar Roger. Marco is from Germany, Sar Roger is from England. They both have done at least two or three Olympic Games. They're five star, they know their stuff. What they give you is what it's worth. And they they're judging all the time. So if they give you 65%, it's worth 65%. You know what was the most amazing thing is that the judges were actually exactly on the same mark. So it really had a lot of power and, and the riders came out of it really, really excited. So then what we did on our WhatsApp group, we put it all up so that the others could see that it's been a positive experience so far. And now of course they all want to do it because it's very useful. Whether you're competing or not, if you are part of USCF, then you can click on that rider's file and you can see, okay, this guy got 68, what does it look like? Because when you do your test, as you can see on the sheet, you have to upload your, your test on YouTube. Uh, which goes to USCF and then Lorraine sends it out to the judges in Europe and then it comes back to Lorraine. And then also I do, after that, I also do my technical comments. So I give the riders advice. Okay, that's what you got. That's what I would do. That's my uh, feedback for what you guys have to do at home to improve your performance. So all of that, the, you know, if, if, if you can see what your next door athlete has done as well. So you can see what why did they get that mark and what does it look like? Of course, you do. So you see it as well. What you can see is what the riders abroad get. You know, just, you can see that online. You just go to a show, whether it's Deauville or Varingham, just click online, look at what they were getting last year. The, the winner of the grade two was on 74%. Okay, those judges are giving me 70%. If I want to be competitive, I need to get another 4%. It, it's perfect. But it's, there's a quite a strong protocol, you can see on the, has to be done from that specific place and the horse has to be braided it's got, because the horse has to be into this sort of show stressy mode. show yeah. mode because mm -hmm. you know, it's not the same, you can't do it at home without plaiting or braiding your horse yeah. and so on. The horse has to be a little bit on the bars because that's what's going to happen in real life. So mm -hmm. you have to recreate that scenario. Mm -hmm. so we have our NAJYRC. It does not always run for para um, dressage, as we've seen. Sometimes it's on the list, sometimes it's off the list. It depends on whether the U.S. and um, typically Canada, if we're able to field um, two, uh, two teams or a team from each country. So that's been a little problematic. There's the U25 championships that I, I think have a slightly different, pro well, they all have different protocols. We're just giving you an overview of kind of what's out there in various cycles, um, could be a WEG year, could be a Paralympic year, but um, this is typically what's being offered. Paradressage nationals are offered each, each year, and then whether there's a one star, two star, or three star, there's typically at least three, star, uh, three, three stars in the country, uh, maybe even four every year. And sometimes they are qualifiers for either a World Games or a Paralympic Games. Um, and then we have our USDF now has some para um, dressage horse of the year awards and then all of that can be found on USEF's website under competitions, um, their, their calendar. But once the profile raises, once the powers in this country, see on the continent it's different. In England, because GB has done so well, they've been on national television like BBC News or Channel 4. You know, breakfast TV, you would have Natasha Baker, Lee Person doing a, a breakfast show talk, you know, on national television. After football, you know, or rugby or soccer. Um, once that happens here one day, that's my dream, mm -hmm. to bring you guys there. Then suddenly, there will be more emulation. People will want to organize shows. People will want to say, oh, you have seen the pass on TV, that's great. Let's do a show for them. And that will happen one day. But first, you guys have got to do well. It's really hard what it is. So the international events, um, you know, again, just a one-star um, 
you guys can look at this, how many nations are invited. Uh, three star is a minimum of six nations invited. In this country, typically two come. Six might be invited, but only two come. Yep. Mexico does not have um, a very going team. Uh, it's really U.S. and Canada that end up competing on the three stars in this continent. So. Um, and then championships or world games, uh, world championships and European championships and the five star, um, which they're not, they took out the, the four, or they will mm -hmm. take out the four and five star, are just called championships and Paralympic games. Um, all yeah. of those tests we talked about are on the FEI website. It's all online. Yeah. It's all online. The, the FEI paradressage rules are online. Again, USDF is adopting and embedding those rules within. They have a paradressage section within the USDF rules, so check it out. But Very there, easy. Just, but just Google FEI test, FEI yeah. rules, comes right away. Preparing for your first competition at the local level. Again, we've, we've really talked about this um, show management. You want to ask them to add para test of choice, preparation, um, you know, create that uh, somewhat more pressurized situation with uh, braiding and, and uh, proper turnout, um, hire a groom, uh, you know, kind of simulate what, what that whole experience would be. And if you um, are scoring in the 50s, you might stay at the schooling shows. But if you're starting to bump up in the 60s, you would start considering a recognized event. Um, these are just the documents and memberships that are within this country, the things that you do need to have, the horse identification number, lifetime registry. There's a lot of paperwork. Um, you need to involve your trainer, your coach, your handler, horse owners. All of those pieces are all spelled out. What to submit when you're entering a, a recognized competition. This is all very detailed, but just for yep. you guys to know about. It's okay. there. Um, we're going to talk about dispensation certificate later. Here's the USCF drug rules. There's a hotline. Call when in doubt. Okay? Understanding international competition, that's Kai Hunt and his horse. FEI is the governing body. Uh, there are paraquestrian judges who are licensed in paradressage and attend educational clinics run by FEI, the international stewards. There are classifiers like CARI and their technical delegates, appeals committee, veterinary con uh, commission. So all of that is part of the FEI committees. Uh, there are three, four, and five star judges. Um, for those of you who know Hanukkah Gerritsen, who's come several times for clinics, she's a five star Paralympic judge. She's often the technical delegate or the head of the ground jury. All the PE judges have to fulfill the FEI requirements and must be at least a pre St. George uh, certification, USEFR judges um, uh, at the National Federation. Um, the, the stewards organize the horse inspection, they're responsible for the timing and the warm up, um, uh, responsible for the arenas and stables, check uh, for compensating aids and bits. We're going to have a whole thing on compensating aids. Uh, monitor the welfare of the horses and coordinate with the technical delegates. And the TDs work closely with all the organizers. Um, the TDs are appointed by the OC and the FEI. They're present at all the international competitions and the classifiers, once all the classifications are completed, the classifiers work with the other show officials to ensure a fair competition. And the, the, the new rule too is that athletes can be reclassified, either they're being called in or they can actually express their, their wish of being reclassified because their condition has progressed. And, and they have to apply with their own federation, so USAF here, six weeks prior to an appointment. So six weeks prior, you should really apply. And international classification means you have to go to an international show to be reclassified. So here it means going to Wellington. Or yeah. But some people have gone abroad. I mean, I know some American riders have traveled abroad to Belgium or whatever to be reclassified. I think most of you will know, of course, um, grade one, just walk, grade two, walk and trot. Uh, but, which is not to say that in grade one you can still use the trot, because that's been asked before, and the canter. If you want in grade one to canter in the warm-up, if the rider has the ability, hmm. some do. Uh, there are a few riders abroad that do sometimes use a little bit of canter, if they can't do that. Uh, and then people will sometimes say, well, how come she can canter in grade one and she's a grade one? You know, the assessment of a, a classifier is not to judge their ability to perform. The, the, the assessment is really strictly a medical assessment and somebody might be quite badly off but still fortunate enough that have enough balance to mm. do a bit of canter. So it's, yeah. it's 
very often unrelated. You can't say that that writer is doing the canto, so it shouldn't be that great. It's nothing to do with actually what's, what's mm. going on. So you will see that. Uh, so it's important to, to remember that, although it's a walk test, some people can actually use a canto. But not in the test. No, in the warm-up, of course. In the warm-up. In the warm-up. Yeah. They can use a canto in the warm-up, and they can use the canto in the, in freestyle? the freestyle yeah. from grade three onwards. Where in grade two, they can't use the canto in the freestyle. Grade four, walk, trot, lateral work, and canto, and five, canter lateral work. So the lateral work becomes in the canter in that grade. The two tests are very similar in terms of, of paces, but what's different between that one and that one? This one is, is based on more collection than the other levels, uh, where this one is collection and extension. So it mm -hmm. requires a quite a very scopy horse, really. What we were discussing before, so another 30 minutes for the trainer coach, 15 minutes before the test. And an official steward must be present. Yes. Yep. And you have to go, if you have to go and find that steward because if you're unlucky, somebody could complain. If, and if it's not written down, you could say, well, but I'm sure we started at that time and the, the rider was not on the horse more than half an hour. Then nobody will believe you. So you've, it's in your, in your interest to actually make sure it's recorded. Uh, and grades four and five have to be schooled by yeah. the athlete themselves. Yeah. No, no trainer can get on in, in school at, at the competition. Yeah. This last one is quite important because in, in part question, everything has to be seen. Well, actually in dressage too, because the stewarding is very important nowadays. You have to be, when you work with your horse at an international competition, you have to do it where you're being seen mm -hmm. by a steward. So if you didn't do that, you could actually get uh, penalized. Hmm. Uh, use of voice. Yeah. Um, also, that's the voice can be as well on the master list. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even as low as a grade one, if you, there's a use of the voice, in grade one you will get riders with, um, what do you call it, mental or psychological? Uh, cognitive uh, impairment. Yeah, mm -hmm. cognitive impairment. Those kind of riders I can think of if you will have a hard time to remember the test. So then they would need to have the test call. So it's fine, it's not a problem, but it has to be on the list. Mm -hmm. It's important to know that because often when people are coming new into the sport, they just don't realize that it has to be actually on the master list. To have but a commander, yeah. yes. And then once it's started, the athlete um, is not allowed to speak to any other person yeah. once the test starts. If there's a quiet horse, you can ask one of the riders, can, can you come in uh, or can your groom come in with, with your horse so that my horse is not so affected? It, we, it means that there'll be you know, a presence in the arena. Uh, it's not always an advantage. Um, Sometimes I've seen horses with a friendly horse being stood there outside the arena, being too clingy with it. Mm. And then it can be a distraction. So mm -hmm. you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. What I mean is something you should really try at home. It can work, but it can also work against you. Sure. That's to do with, you know what horses are like. You don't want to have your, the horse in the arena calling the other one, mm -hmm. like they do sometimes, you know, friendly horses do that. They call each other and the, the, the test is a mess, isn't it? Yeah. And that's got to be clarified with the steward. So if you've got a friendly horse, you've got to make sure the stewards know. Uh, and if you, you can also have up to four people in the arena, up to grade three. So maximum competitions per day, athletes are allowed uh, two tests per day per horse and major championships, no athlete may ride more than one horse in one competition. Mm -hmm. All other competitions, one athlete may ride two horses in their grade. And this is understanding compensating aids and essentially adaptive equipment, what's allowable, what's standard, mm -hmm. what's non-standard, and defining that. So that's in your book under compensating aids. So compensating aids defined, they're used to compensate for the physical or sensory limitation resulting from an athlete's impairment, thereby enabling him or her to participate in sport. These aids must not give the athlete any advantage beyond compensating for the impairment, or they may be used for safety reasons. And there's two types um, broken out by aids that assist the rider, like collars and whips, and adaptations or modifications to compensate for loss of function like loop reins for a rider with poor grasp and poor control of limbs would be for securing stirrup leathers to the girth. So as we go through, there's gonna be some photographs and then we're gonna talk again about um, what's standard and non-standard. 
There is a sheet in the back. It should be a graph of standard and non-standard, um, sort of the allowable. So the, the compensating aids, I mean, it's important to understand where it all comes from. And if you keep it very simple, it would go back basically to maybe an amputee rider who's got part of the arm missing. <laughs> well, obviously, they have to do something to be able to catch that rain. So that's really where it comes from. Um, Sometimes you have to have a device to attach the rein to somebody's elbow if the arm doesn't go further than that. That's where really it started. But what has happened since historically is that that list of, of aids like that have just grown immensely <laughs> because... People are creative. People are creative. There's more and more and more coming into it. Um, and, you know, you've got to you use the, the, the resources. I mean, obviously, if, if, if you didn't have that, it just wouldn't be possible to ride, the riders have to have compensating aids. Um, so again, a rider without legs may carry two whips. Uh, the whips act as their leg aids, essentially. Um, a rider with <coughs> one arm may ride with one hand only. A blind rider may have living letters. We're going to get into that and actually we'll show um, a, a, a visually <coughs> impaired rider um, later on when we're showing videos. Um, and living letters are really quite something. We've done a lot with um, a visually impaired writer that, we, that comes several times to Carlisle, and so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Aids to compensate for memory or cognitive impairment. Um, this is, again, tied to classification. It's not a primary disability, but if it's secondary to a, to a physical um, challenge, um, maybe there's some memory or cognitive impairment that, that uh, requires that they have a <coughs> commander. A commander is not a caller, a commander is a test reader. Um, and you have to have a psychologist report in order to have your test called to you or commanded to you. It's to compensate for hearing uh, impaired, for sensory loss related to hearing impairment. Uh, competitors who are deaf um, or hearing impaired may use sign language or radio communication. A steward must be present during the dressage test if this form of commanding is used. It's to compensate for visual impairment. Again, it's the caller, not the commander. And that's the person calling for the letters with visual impairments. And then we have a video we're going to yeah. show you. So I can yeah. tell you more about this one. Um, it's actually been redefined in the new rules for next year. Uh, you can have, you can have uh, callers at each letter around the arena, which is quite a luxury because mm -hmm. you've got to have a lot of people with you and you've got to know them and you've got to know their voice. Or you can have the one person, mm -hmm. the one caller who would be in the arena, usually sort of on the center line. So this is just more in depth because riding with visual impairment is really kind of an art in and of itself as well as the, the callers that are accompanying them. So I'll just read through this. When first entering the arena, they're permitted to ride around the inside of the arena once in each direction and change the rein once. During this time, the living letter should call. That means they're calling the letter as the rider goes by that letter. This will give the rider the opportunity to familiarize themselves with the sound of each individual voice at each letter before starting their dressage test. They usually need one or more callers. Uh, individuals stand motionless, one behind each letter around the dressage arena. As the rider passes one letter, the living rider standing at the next letter uh, begins to call their letter clearly and rhythmically. You'll see it in the video. Um, when the rider reaches the living letter, that person calls their letter slightly louder. So they would say M, 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 M. Mm. And that's when they're on that letter. Um, and when, uh, let's see, and then stops and the next person standing at the next letter starts in on their call. I think this is really a case of a lot of practicing. Yeah. Blind riders or riders with a visual impairment, they need to practice a lot. The horse has to practice a lot. The rider needs to practice because it, it gets better and better. Mm. It is a question of repeating, rehearsing a lot. I think it's one of the most difficult um, grades. Or, or disability. Or disabilities. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, very difficult mm -hmm. because no matter how hard you try, that rider will never be as accurate as a rider that has full vision. I mean, it's just, you know, where do you yeah. go? It's a little bit of an unfair disability because it's very, very hard. Having said that, there's been a lot of, I mean, Nikki Green here, she's a top mm -hmm. class rider. There's a very good girl too in uh, Norway who rides really, really well. There's a girl in France who is in grade five, so she's obviously partly. Uh, impaired, but it is difficult. Mm. 
It is un accuracy. almost unto, the, unto itself. Yeah. If when you speak to judges, they will always tell you it's always, sometime if a rider like that doesn't win, it's just because they've lost a little bit on the accuracy. Mm. They'll be up there, but they might lose to a gold or a silver medal because of that. Yeah. Very difficult. Uh, modifications or adaptations to saddlery, we'll look at that. Raised pieces on the saddle, you'll see some pictures, special reins, stirrups. Uh, riding attire, um, maybe no gloves, um, perhaps the addition of uh, two <coughs> whips, spurs, um, postural supports. Um, and the note here is an aid may be used if it's approved for all pair questions or is indicated on the athlete's master list or dispensation certificate, but it's not required to be used, meaning you don't have to use it if it's on your list. So this is just a look at some various compensating aids, and you all can look at that graph later. Here's some pictures of uh, compensating aids. Uh, one in the middle, incorrect cantle would be too high, uh, greater than 12 centimeters, that's the lower bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, tw t 12 centimeters from seat to top of cantle, um, so that's too high. Um, to the right, we have the adaptive saddle with raised cantle and seat saver. Um, also single solid uh, handhold that's up on the right. And then we have um, measurement of the depth of the saddle when, when seat is pressed down distance from top. Seat to top of cantle or pommel is no greater than 12 centimeters. So really that depth mm. of seat. You, you can't tuck them in too much. Adaptive saddle with uh, knee guides is here, right? the, the one to the lower left. Um, seat savers, removable attachment to the seat, um, adding padding um, for protection for you know, skin breakdown um, or sensory impairment um, <coughs> can be made of various material, and then side saddle is an option. Um, saddle with double hard handhold, um, there's a soft handhold, um, and then the saddle with uh, single hard handhold and Velcro to assist foot to stirrup in the Devonshire boot. So lots of, um, lots of options. Example of loop reins. They're normally on a buckle and they have a loop there so they just slide along. Mm. They're better. But yeah. it's better with a loop like that that slides along than having this kind of loop. Yes. Because this kind of loop, which is a double rein with increments, yeah. um, like Gigi used to have that, it's very hard to get yes. into it. So you, you would have, for instance, two loops on each rein, one for free walk or uh, mm -hmm. stretching the walk, and one for your normal competition outline. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to have two. If the rider is quite able with the hand, borderline, then you could have just one loop and then for the free walk you would just let the reins go and then come back into your loops. So you've got either option. The bar that we have is not so wide. This yeah. is a very wide it's normally picture. Yeah, normally it's not so wide as that. Yeah. Normally That's when there's a bar it's usually about yeah, yeah. five inches. And there's some sort of flexibility in the leather itself so it's not like a, a, a stiff. piece of, sti you know, you, you want to be able to have some flexion in there because um, you're kind of working both sides of the mouth. Rubber band just securing the foot to the stirrup. This is a very typical one. You, yeah. you all probably have seen that. People take um, pieces of tire or that you can get really heavy duty rubber band, but it should be black if you do, just for show purposes. Um, the Devonshire, yep, yeah, same sort of connection. And then this is uh, securing the, um, making a secured connection from the stirrup to the girth. Um, so the dispensation certificate is, again, back to the recognized events issued by USAF for athletes with disabilities in any discipline. The certificate indicates name, profile, grade, uh, grade status, meaning the new, reviewed, confirmed. Um, approved compensating aids and expiration date. It's submitted with the entry form for show organizers and officials at recognized shows to indicate allowed compensating aids. Um, athletes competing in standard equipment and attire do not need a dispensation certificate. So if they may have impairments but don't require any adaptations, they don't need a certificate. So athletes with dispensation certificates who enter a traditional dressage test, non-para, um, must include a dispensation certificate with the class entry. So again, let's say a rider goes in with two whips, well that's not typically allowed in a traditional dressage test, so you do want to show and you just submit it with your entry if you're doing able-bodied. Um, athletes competing at FEI do not need to submit their USEF dispensation because there's the FEI master list. So as soon as it's FEI, it shifts over to the master list. Yeah. Um, 
And this is really, really important, and that's the graph at the end of the um, section in your book. The standard aids are approved by the classifier based on the assigned profile grade and function of the athlete. That's what we were talking about Carrie would do. Um, and then non-standard aids must be approved by the FEI Compensating Aids Committee with proof that the aid is safe and humane for the athlete and the horse. Um, and then the use of an, any aid can be revoked by any official if they note that the aid is unsafe or inhumane, again, for rider or horse. Um, so so the, they are, there is a, uh, this is the under review, they're in the process of reviewing non-standard aids with the goal of limiting the use of non-standard aids. Um, again, it's always important to go back and look at the update. Because the list has just grown. <laughs> yeah, right. So I think it's gone to a point where they have to say, you know, it's if it's enough, much. we need to yeah. limit it a little bit. This is the link I just gave you, and this is actually, this is a hot link to the um, FEI okay. page um, on the dispensation certificate, and so people out there who click on that get, get all that. Um, show a tire, so we actually, we've covered some of this already in compensating aids. Protective headgear must be worn by athletes as well as any other person at all times while mounted. Hats may not be removed for salutes or mounted prize giving ceremonies. Um, functional profile 36 um, in grade four, which is blind or visually impaired, no longer are required to wear a blindfold. Um, blacked out glasses or goggles while competing. And the armband with distinctive color must be worn at all times by grade four and five that have visual impairment. Yep. Um, Military may wear civil or service dress at all USCF recognized competitions. I imagine, too, at championships, we just ha haven't yeah, really yeah. gone there, obviously. Yeah. It's been more... And also, yeah. armband for trainers at shows. Most shows will require to have a, an armband to recognize the trainer coach on the uh, rider's horse. It's just for recognition, so that we can see the difference. So, and, and the organizer normally would provide that. It's very often one of those reflecting yellowish type of thing? Uh, I think that this is, again, we've done a little bit of this in the other um, PowerPoint, but what's interesting is that in all grades of para, double bridle is allowed. It's very different than um, able-bodied dressage, where double is only allowed um, yes. third and above. Yes, a good point. Yeah. So, and that's in part because sometimes there's added leverage needed, um, uh, you know, just the, the that that's helpful beyond yeah. the snaffle. And compensating aids too, with a double bridle, you can have your reins joined up mm -hmm. with a buckle in the middle, so you can adjust the tension on the snaffle bridle yeah. rather uh, versus the curb. Yeah. So that's also on the list. A lot of the other stuff we've already gone through. Ear hoods are permitted now in all events. Um, noise cancelling. Pardon? Yeah. With noise, noise cancelling, yeah. Yes, and they provide noise reduction, um, and, but earplugs are not permitted while competing, but they're allowed at prize giving ceremony. Interesting one too, that one, just like we were talking about, like people in the arena, which originally was really strictly for safety. Uh, ear hoods are originally for bugs, mm. to protect flies in the summer, where now they're using for noise. Uh, and it's, it's been allowed now in dressage too internationally for the last year or so, where they can be thicker, like neoprene, like swimsuit yeah. material. So it, it, it doesn't cut the noise out completely, but it uh, limits the noise by something like, I think, 40%. The arena and exercise um, areas at competitions, yep. um, grade one through three is 20 by 40, grade four and five is 20 by 60. Um, letters placed are about five centimeter, 50 centimeters from the fence and clearly, they're all clearly marked. Um, Let's see, uh, a part of the fence at A um, is removed and put back when the rider enters and exits the arena. Um, and a practice arena must be avail available for blind athletes to train alone. Um, times will be arranged by the chief steward. Judges' sheets, um, corrected score must be initialed by the judge. The scores must be recorded in ink. Marks of five and below will be justified by remarks. The other um, marks are also also need comments. 0.5 marks may also be used for movements and collective marks at the discretion of the judge. The judges team must sign the results sheets after the class is finished before they can be published. And once the classes have been completed and the writer has re received the test, he or she has 30 minutes to review the score calculations. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Okay. Prize giving, you want to talk about that one? 
Uh, you have again, to show up. You got to show up. <laughs> what it is is to do with, I mean, organize a very hot uh, uh, for respecting sponsors and VIPs. It's to do with really organizers. They, when they have sponsors, which is, you know, so important for them to have that financial backup, you know, it's very important that to be very respectful, to be there. If it's been re requested by the organizers that you must come to a prize game, you have to do it because it's a, it's a mark of respect. What's happening now is that less and less there are mountain prize givings. There's been too many accidents where you have people falling off when horse to get excited. So I'm not sure in this country, but abroad, it's, I would say it's nearly always yeah, on mounted. foot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's recommended, and that you should still wear your, your same attire. That your you same should. attire. Sometime at major championship, they will ask the, 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 the winning horse to come in hand, so it looks nicer for the... It's to do with the press, the photos, and so on. It looks nicer of a horse in the picture. But not always. It's not a requirement, but you, you might have to bring the top horse in the prize giving. Yeah. So uh, we're now in the last section. This, uh, there's something in your book called FEI Guidelines uh, for the Marking of Fundamental Mistakes in Paraquestrian Dressage Movements. So we're going to talk about what the judges are looking for in the various movements and within the various grades. And then we'll show some videos at the end. But this is a really helpful guide. Do you, yep. you know that one? The famous six, six scales of dressage. I think it's, uh, it's to me, that's very important for actually developing young horses. So whether it's a young dressage horse or power horse, it's just very important to, apart from the collection mark, everything else has to be in there. And, and for a very, very young horse, it's really all of them beside collection and impulsion. Really, it's, it's all to do with the young horse, you know, straightness, contact, suppleness, and, and rhythm. When you've got experience, it just comes naturally. You don't even think of it. It's just, mm. you know, of course, your horse has to be relaxed and supple and, and you've got to have rhythm, you know, not too fast, not too slow. It's got to be straight, you don't want to have a horse squeeze. All of that is common sense really. It's, it's there on paper, but I think most trainers are aware of, of the guidelines. Um, it's nothing different. Um, the collective marks are the marks at the bottom, Susanna, you know, the four marks at the bottom. It's not just what the horse is born with, uh, regularity and freedom, that can be uh, impaired by the rider. If the rider is a little bit too tight, the freedom disappears. The same if there is tension in the horse's back, the regularity of the pace will be affected. So it can be induced by the rider, it can be induced by the environment through tension. Um, activity, uh, the word has changed where before people would just talk about forwardness or impulsion. Activity is a good word. Uh, because people are less inclined to go too fast or run with the horses. You know what I mean? When you talk about activity, it means what it means. But sometimes when you tell people, go forward, what they do first is just go faster. <laughs> so this is a good word, especially in coaching, uh, to use. Mm -hmm. uh, submission is another word that's disappearing a little bit because it's a little bit old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. You probably would use more, well, harmony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. harmony and, and attention to the rider. But I think yeah. that's been in discussion to change mm -hmm. the word as well mm -hmm. with the FEI. Um, a Christian feel is, it, because those are the new, the new wording, that's uh, used, that's to replace the rider mark, you know. Oh, position. Yeah, and, yeah. position and so on. Yeah. So now they call it a Christian feel because people have felt that if you just talk about the rider's position, it becomes too aesthetic rather than functional. functional. So you're losing the, the feel element in it. A good power dressage judge will not judge on the basis of sympathetic or empathy <laughs> uh, judging, if you know what I mean. It's not because they see a, a, a rider with a disability that they're going to be more lenient and feel sorry for the rider. So they might, okay, I would normally give a, a six, but he's a power rider, so I'll give him a seven. That's not what they think. And they're quite, they just, what it is, they are taught to basically judge what they see. And it has, to, they, they look at the horse and it has to do the same thing that a dressage rider would do or a power dressage rider would do. It has to look the same, whether you've got a power rider or not on top. So that's the way they're being trained and it's tough. But we're trying to really produce as good a picture as we would in pure dressage. I mean, grade one is basically the walk. And the walk is a, probably the most difficult pace to ride. It's got to be 
active and relaxed uh, because activity sometimes can promote a little bit of tension and if it's too relaxed it can sometimes be not active <laughs> if you see what I mean it's one one way or the other so it's got to be both and a top class walk is very difficult and it needs a horse that has got it because we all know from experience that you can't probably it's the most difficult pace to alter if the horse has got a not such a good walk by nature it's virtually impossible to change the horse is born with a walk and it is what it is but of course as a rider you have to still make sure that uh, you maintain engagement activity and relaxation those are the three main components and it sounds simple but it's very very hard you don't tell the horse supple and active uh, and engaged it's, it's very very hard because if you try a little bit too hard you might create tension in the back and there's a lot of things that could disappear and um, it has all changed and the reason it's a, they've gone from free walk to a stretch now is to not disadvantage horse that might not have the biggest of walks so before if a horse had a really big walk with a free walk it could get extra mark because the horse had more ground coverage where now if the horse is more limited in the ground coverage but stretches nicely they will still get a good mark because they had the difference so the stretch is a focus on the mark now not so much the ground coverage or the gain in ground coverage and that's the difference I think what's um, more difficult in that grade now is that there are more transitions that there used to be before between the walk and the trot. Uh, the leg yield also is difficult because what you have to think that, imagine the leg yield as a rider, it's actually a good one, it's difficult in a mm -hmm. walk than it is in a trot because in a trot you've got more natural impulsion Momentum, yeah. and it's almost easier to ride a trot leg yield than it is to ride a walk leg yield. And especially with a rider with a weakness, a uh, weak rider uh, will struggle much more in the walk. And you see it time after time after time. Uh, grade 3, so grade 3 is uh, trot and walk, so it's the same as grade 2, but there's, this is more, there's more trot than in grade 2. And the transitions in trot is, is medium trot now, rather than showing length and stride. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be from marker to marker. So it's a little bit more precise, defined transitions, marker to marker. Leg uh, yield at trot. Yeah. Trot leg yield. Mm -hmm. The half turn, that was suggested that some riders didn't want to have it, but it has remained. Uh, half turn on the haunches, also a difficult one in that test. Half mm -hmm. a meter basically mm -hmm. is the size. It's a more difficult test than the older test. Uh, that's because of the introduction of collection in grade four. Now you have more collection than there used to be. Uh, so you will need a horse that's got natural self-carriage and the ability to collect, basically. A lot of riders are trying to sometime uh, maybe find a horse that had done before third or fourth level in that grade because the horse had already some sort of a concept of collection which makes it easier. So it's a collection because in the grade five, the grade after that is that plus extension. Mm. So that's how the progression is. So grade five you need a real spooky, uh, scopy horse because it's, it's got to collect and extend. So you're talking about advanced able-bodied level. Simple change in freestyle people tend to use, well they have to use a simple change because it's one of the compulsories. Yeah but they will add on some flying changes to make it more interesting. And if the flying changes come well, it will be good. But what you have to remember is in, in, in all the grades, when you do something a little bit more difficult, because it's not a compulsory, it doesn't give you extra mark. The, the, we don't have a mark for, it doesn't affect the degree of difficulty because it's not a compulsory. But equally, um, if it doesn't come off, it might look messy, so then you're going to lose in harmony, that's the way it is. But in the olden days, we had, uh, it would actually affect the degree of difficulty, but not anymore. It's only affecting the harmony, so it's a big risk to take. If you're not sure it's going to come off, I always tell the riders, don't do something too difficult, because at the end of the day, if it doesn't come off, it looks more messy, mm. and it's not a nice test anymore. And allowed movements, forbidden movements, if you do something that's not allowed, you will get marked down. If you forget uh, a compulsory movement, it's actually a knot. You get zero, so it's a killer. It happens quite a lot. People forget they might do a circle on the left and not a circle on the right, where well, you get a zero. So it's, it's, it's a killer in your mark because it's, once you get a zero in your, 
uh, marking, you will drop down massively. So it's very important to, to not have that happen. I always tell the riders when you, do, when you design a freestyle, get your compulsories done first. That gives you a little bit of time at the end to sometimes redo something because the advantage of a freestyle is to have the ability to redo a movement that's not come up in the right way. So let's say if you were to do uh, simple changes in grade five and in one the horse jogged, well if you have time at the end to redo it again then the judge will average a two marks. So you got a four because it was a bad simple change, your second simple change you got a, uh, an eight, so then you're, you're going to end up with the average mark being over six. So it does give you a chance to improve your mark. And that's why you want to do your compulsory first when you do a, a freestyle and leave some room at the end so you have a chance to redo something. You can regain some percentage. And that's for all the grades, really. So that's just talking about the new, new movement replacing um, the free walk is the stretch on a longer rein for grade one, two, and three, and extended walk for four and five. And it's just talking about what they're looking for. An extended being because you're going from a collected walk to an extended walk. So that's Frank Hosma from Holland, grade five. <coughs> Okay, so that's Athene, grade one, with that girl, new person, only been riding the horse for two and a half months. So she was triple gold medalist there, and she was on 80%. Sorry? It's not a free walk anymore, it's a stretch walk. <laughs> So that's your best walk in the world. The mare is still world number one. This is your standard. <coughs> Grade three as well, Susanna Hex is one of my students. She used to be an event rider, international rider, and she broke her back, so now she's a power rider. First championship for her, and she was also a triple gold medalist in grade three. <coughs> But you can see all those top riders, they all have good holes because often in tests like that you have three holes, five judges, you can see if you do your math, you must, you need to have good holes. Grade five, that's Sophie Wells. No, it's not, that's a new, she's had the horse a year and a half, two years I think. That is absolutely amazing, absolutely. Um, again, Susanna Hex, uh, grade three, newcomer, first time championship, ex-event uh, rider. Everything you've seen there, whether it's just walk or walk and trot or, you know, whether there's a full amputee or fingers missing, whatever it is, it's, it's the quality of riding is just really matching the able-bodied. What defines the paraquestrian high-performance athlete? Um, really, you would know best on that one. Again. Yeah, self-explanatory. The scores are really important, high 60s, 70s, but also it's more the, the very strong professional support, uh, whether it's a physiotherapist <laughs> or an osteopath. You have to work hard uh, on the disability side of things because it will make you ride better. You know, an athlete might just be
tight in the body through a disability, so you've got to work with your physio sometimes very often just before riding to make yourself already looser, more supple, better. Uh, a top athlete would have a strong awareness of body imbalance, uh, not being straight. You know, if, if, if you've got a, a if you're an amputee or if you've got a one-sided uh, disability, your body will be out of balance very easily, which is not good when it comes to riding. But with a strong support of a physio or osteopath, you can actually start improving a lot on that. And you see the difference with the athletes. The ones that don't and the ones that do have that support, they ride much better. And it, it, it could be, you know, in terms of like scores, you could see somebody who doesn't might just be stuck in a 66, 68 scores, and somebody who does, you can add up another two or three percent. So it does make that difference, and that's what brings you up to being a top athlete into performance. That's what it is. I wanted to point out too another interesting um, piece to the COEs is that um, because they often have therapists right there, because they're doing therapy as a track. Um, when we borrow them for sport, you know, we're focusing on stretching and strengthening programs, not so much therapeutic intervention. So it's, those are kind of the benefits of marrying, too, because you can borrow from your existing resources. Um, oh, it's me there. I'm yeah, sure. there you are. There's a lot more to come in the coach development program that uh, Michelle's putting together on... Uh, you know, just ways that we can support our athletes and the leveling that's going to go on and the training for coaches um, to help. And this just talks about the importance of putting a team together with horse owners, athletes, coaches, uh, as well as um, grooms yeah. if needed, um, just your whole support team. And there's been a lot of discussion through the years of how do we fund this. You know, I think funding is, is such a critical point, um, especially for para-athletes. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, and I think we can do a whole lot better in this country to help athletes with funding. Um, but, you know, like everything, it's coming. There's incremental steps, but, but it, we do know from um, experience that the athlete and their team, uh, his or her team, has to put together mm -hmm. a short-range and a long-range plan for how they're going to um, fund various things, horse expenses, travel expenses, groom fees, mm -hmm. um, competition fees, clinics, um, going to Florida, all of those things. And you can put that together in a comprehensive budget. And then you got your expense line, and then you go over to your income side and say, how am I going to make this happen? This presentation is part of a library of resources for uh, understanding paraquestrian sports. And the presentations include an introduction to paraquestrian dressage, an introduction to paraquestrian driving, understanding paraquestrian classification. This course material was produced by Sarah Armentrout, head of school at Carlisle Academy in October of 2017, and it includes contributions from Will Connell, USCF Sport Director, Michelle Asseline, USCF Paradressage Coach Development Director, Lorraine Johnson, USCF Paraquestrian Discipline Director, Hope Han, USPEA President, J.H. Gerritsen, five-star FEI Paralympic Dressage Judge, Joanne Benjamin, PT, HPCS FEI Classifier, Tina Wenz, PT, FEI classifier, and Carrie Sowers, PT, DPT, NCS, and FEI classifier. The copyright is owned by the United States Equestrian Federation, and duplication or disbursement of this material is by permission only.